Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. This video is kind of random because I literally woke up today and I was like, I wanna talk about mushrooms. So over the last 18 months, one of my COVID hobbies that I've developed is learning about foraging and mushrooms. Some people learned how to make bread. I decided to learn about mushrooms. So today I just kind of wanted to show you guys all the cool mushrooms that I found and have been able to identify for the most part. I'm still relatively new at this, so please take everything I say with a grain of salt and know that I am not a mushroom expert, but hopefully one day I will be. <laughs> a general rule about mushrooms and foraging for wild plants is that if you can't confidently identify it, then do not eat it. I've never actually eaten any of the mushrooms that I found because even though there are a few that I was 110% confident that were edible, I still don't trust myself. <laughs> also, before we get into it, I just wanted to show you guys my t-shirt because I feel like it's very fitting for this video. It actually just came in the mail before I started filming this, so like literally the perfect timing. <laughs> this t-shirt is actually from my stepbrother's apparel brand called Conservancy Collective. If you want to get this t-shirt or any other cool nature-themed apparel, I'll leave his information down in the description. Now, let's talk about mushrooms. And to be honest, I don't entirely know what exactly got me so fascinated with mushrooms. I've always been super fascinated with nature and plants, as I'm sure you know. And this is just another cool facet of that that I really liked exploring. And literally, as soon as I started finding mushrooms and learning about what was what, I just became addicted, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. For me, it's kind of like a scavenger hunt, if you will, especially since I'm still in the beginning stages of learning to identify mushrooms. It's always super satisfying when I come across a certain species and I'm able to identify it. Or even if I can't identify it, it's kind of cool trying to figure out what it could possibly be and having various discussions in online forums about mushrooms. Anyways, let me show you guys some of the mushrooms that I found. So back in April, I want to say, I went on my first major foraging adventure. Even though it was still kind of wintry and not a ton of stuff was growing, I kind of wanted to get out there just to get a sense of what my surroundings were like. When I first started getting into mushrooms, one of the first things I was told is that it's super important to learn your land and know what the environment is like around you. Because certain mushroom species grow in certain environments and a lot of them are symbiotic with certain types of trees. So yeah, back in April, I decided to head about two hours north of Toronto and just see what I could find. And the first fungi I came across was this tinder polypore, which is also known as hoof fungus, which is very fitting because it looks a lot like a hoof. <laughs> At first, I actually didn't even realize that this was some fungi because it just blends in so well with the birch bark. And the more I learned about these, the more I'm just like fascinated with it. <laughs> tinder polypore has a really long lifespan compared to other mushrooms, which usually fruit and then die off within a couple days. But because it's a bracket fungi, it's really hardy and it can actually withstand the winter. So after the winter, it will keep growing and just keep getting bigger and bigger each year, unless obviously someone picks it. <laughs> and on that note, the only reason a person would really want to pick this is for survival. As the name would suggest, tinder polypore is really good for starting fires. Once you get into the actual flesh, of the fungi, it's like a spongy texture inside. So you can dry the sponge out and then use it as tinder to start fire. Or you can also use it to address wounds, which is what a lot of people did way, way back in the day. And when I say way back in the day, I mean like 3000 BC back in the day. Archaeologists actually found a bunch of tinder polypore on a nomad's body that was traversing the Swiss Alps. Obviously he didn't make it, but it was suggested that he carried this fungi on him for survival in the harsh conditions. So if the world ever comes to an end and you need to start the fire, you should find yourself some tinder polypore. But that being said, it takes a really long time to grow, especially to be the size that I found. So only harvest it if you absolutely need it. On the same day, I also discovered this one. This is called a scarlet cup or scarlet elf cup. Even though this fungi is really bright, it can actually be really hard to find it. It's commonly growing underneath decaying wood and and leaf litter. And I almost completely missed it. In fact, there was actually a family that was hiking ahead of me and this little boy was like, 
oh my God, look at this cool mushroom. And immediately I was like, where? So I got this little boy to show me the mushroom that he found. And I was like, oh my God, it's so bright and beautiful. And these guys look so weird because they almost look like if someone cut a rubber ball in half. There are mixed reviews about whether or not this fungi is edible because while it's not toxic, it's not exactly the most pleasant thing to eat because of the texture. So it's one of those fungi where it's like, just because you can doesn't mean you should. But that being said, just because you can't eat it doesn't mean that the scarlet cuff doesn't have any benefits. In traditional medicine, it was used by the Oneida people for addressing wounds. Basically what they would do is dehydrate the fungi, turn it into a powder, and then apply it to the wound to both cauterize and promote healing. So taking a break from mushrooms that I've been able to identify, Let's move on to some mushrooms that I haven't, but I still wanted to share them with you because I thought they were pretty cool. Up next, we have what I like to call the mystery lactarius mushroom because I think it's a lactarius species, but I'm not 100% sure. So last summer, my family and I went up to a cottage in Muskoka and the weather was super rainy, which wasn't ideal for, you know, being out on the lake and doing all your usual cottage time activities. But it was really great for mushrooms because every day there was so many of them fruiting around the property. So it was really cool to go around and see what was coming up that day. And this was one of the biggest mushrooms that I found. I've looked through my reference books and I can't quite find something that matches the description of this mushroom. At first I thought it might be a Miller mushroom, but then after asking a few people in Facebook mushroom groups, they think it might be some sort of lactarius species. Although nobody has really confirmed what type of species that is. So I mean, if any of you watching this know what it is, please let me know down in the comments because it's such a cool and thick mushroom and like, I just wanna know what it is. <laughs> the reason I think it might be in the lactarius family is because because of these little droplets here. So lactarius mushrooms are also called milk cap or milky cap mushrooms because when you cut them or disturb the gills, this milky substance kind of comes to the surface. I noticed on some of the photos I took, I could see these little droplets, which kind of look milky, but at the same time, I'm like, is it just from the rain? I found it in a mixed woods forest, but there were mostly coniferous trees there. And one other distinct feature was that the inside of the stem was hollow. I don't exactly know if this was because there was a slug eating it, but I do know that there are some mushroom species where the stems are hollow. If any of you guys can help me identify this mushroom, that would be greatly appreciated because I've literally been trying to figure it out for months now. <laughs> the next mushroom is one that I seriously have no leads on, but I do think it is a really cool mushroom. I also found this up at the cottage and there was like clusters of them all over the property. It's this guy. According to this field guide, I have two potential leads as to what it might be. The first one is the Lactarius rufus, which is this guy right here. Like the top kind of matches, but the gills don't necessarily look pink. I was also kind of leaning towards the common Lacaria because again, it kind of looks like it at the top, but like the gills don't quite match the description. And that's the annoying thing about trying to find out what a species was that you found months ago, because you don't have the actual mushroom to do any additional tests on. Like if I knew it might have been a Lacteria species, I might have tried to, you know, cut it open, see if it produced any milk, maybe gave it a little sniff, see if it had any distinctive smells, or if it bruised a certain color, but unfortunately I just have photos. <laughs> Again, like the last mushroom, if you happen to know what this guy is, please let me know because it's bugging me so much. <laughs> Moving away from mushrooms I have no idea about, I'm going to show you some more that I am fairly confident that I was able to identify correctly. These ones are from a more recent adventure where again, I think I drove about two hours outside of Toronto. I went to a conservation area with my friend and as the name would state, I did not actually pick or harvest anything because it's a conservation area. <laughs> I know some conservation areas will allow you to pick mushrooms and plants, but part of me just didn't feel right doing it, you know? 
And sometimes you do have to pick the mushroom in order to get a proper identification because it helps to look at the mushroom from all different angles, see what the stem or stipe is like, if there's a ring on it, what the gills look like underneath. There's, there's a lot of things that go into identifying mushrooms. <laughs> so these mushrooms and fungi are ones that I observed in their natural habitat. I did not pick them or disturb them in any way. Hence why I'm calling this segment of the video the mushrooms. I'm 99% sure I know the species, but I don't want to confidently say what it is. Like I said, I'm still new at this and I'm just happy to be talking about mushrooms, okay? <laughs> so this guy I'm pretty sure is an oyster mushroom. I know the quality of the photo is terrible because I had to zoom in my camera in order to get the picture because it was so deep into the brush that I didn't want to go off the trail because again, it's a conservation area. So I am fairly confident that it is an oyster mushroom just based off of the way it's growing. And I've also grown oyster mushrooms myself and they have taken this shape. However, the only thing that kind of bamboozles me is usually oyster mushrooms will grow in clusters, but I mean, it is kind of a small stump. So, you know, maybe there was just the one or maybe something else had eaten the other mushrooms. The next mushroom I discovered was one that was like 40 feet up in a tree, <laughs> but it was so big and recognizable that again, I'm like 99% sure I know what it was, but I don't want to say 100% because I wasn't able to get like a fully close up look at it. This is a dryad saddle, which is also known as a pheasant back. Again, I know the photo quality is kind of terrible because I had to zoom in a lot just to be able to see it. But with Dryad Saddle, they do have this distinctive speckling feature on the mushroom. And also instead of gills, which majority of the mushrooms that I have previously explained have, these guys have pores. I saw a bunch of these throughout the trail that we were walking on and I found it kind of interesting because from what I've read, they usually only grow in spring and fall, but they can grow in summer depending on the conditions and this summer our weather's just been so flip-floppy here in Ontario that I'm pretty sure everything, plants, trees, fungi, are just like, what the heck is going on? Basically what I'm saying is even though I found it in August, it's not uncommon to discover a dried saddle in summer. I think this is the first mushroom in this video that I'm gonna tell you guys. It's an edible mushroom. See, there it is right there. Wait, oyster mushrooms are edible too. I forgot to say that. So I guess this technically isn't the first uh, edible mushroom I've shown you in this video. But yes, oysters and dryad saddle mushrooms are edible. Just make sure you cook them first. Never eat raw wild mushrooms. And the last mushroom I found on my hike, I'm 99% sure it's turkey tail. This is what it looks like. And I'm 99% sure it is turkey tail and people in mushroom Facebook groups seem to agree. The only thing I'm kind of skeptical about is how dark the brown is because most pictures of turkey tail are this lighter kind of tan colored brown. So I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty confident. And it's actually really cool if this is in fact turkey's tail because there is so much cool science going on right now with it. Even if you aren't super familiar with fungi, I'm sure at some point you've stumbled across an article that talks about the health claims of turkey tail mushroom. And even though there is still a lot of research that needs to be done and a lot of these claims haven't been fully proven, this particular type of fungi is showing real promises in the world of cancer treatment. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about it completely replacing modern medicine cancer treatments. It's more so something that scientists are looking at using in conjunction with modern medicine. And I mean, modern medicine originated from traditional medicine. So I think it's important that we don't completely forget the roots of where everything came from. So with bracket fungi like this, you don't want to eat it directly because it's not going to be a good experience. It's pretty inedible in regards to texture because it's very thick and stiff. So it just be like you're chewing on a piece of rubber. <laughs> what people do to utilize turkey tail is they'll harvest the fungi, dehydrate it, and then crush it into a powder, which they then mix into drinks or teas, or some people put them in capsules and then take them as supplements. So now we're gonna move on to the mushrooms that I found at my dad's house. My dad lives in a rural area, so often I get to find a lot of cool plants and mushrooms in there. This here is a shaggy mane mushroom. This one I discovered last year, and it's a little past its prime in this photo. These mushrooms are edible, but just 
not when they look like this. You'll want to eat them when they look like this. The Shaggy Mane is also referred to as the Shaggy Ink Cap because as you might have noticed in the photo, there's all this black substance at the bottom. Basically, when these mushrooms get too mature, they start producing an ink, which is basically, it just starts like dripping and decomposing into this like black goop. And another name is the Lawyer's Wig because the next mushroom I found at my dad's was this guy. And I'm totally gonna butcher the name of it. This guy is a Lococo Prinus Burnbami. Excellent! I'm terrible with the Latin names. When it comes to mushrooms or houseplants, I generally refer to them as their common names because my pea-sized brain just can't grasp the Latin names. <laughs> Unfortunately, this one doesn't have an official common name, but a lot of people typically refer to it as the yellow houseplant mushroom. That's because some people will often see these little guys start sprouting in their houseplants. And even though they're funky looking, they're nothing to be worried about. In fact, it's actually a really good sign that your soil is super healthy. It's not harmful to the plant at all, so you can choose to remove it or you can just leave it in the pot and when it decomposes, it'll put nutrients back into the soil for you. And lastly, this one was actually a recent fungi that I discovered at my dad's a few weeks ago. It is a gray bird's nest fungi. There are several types of bird nest fungi, but they all generally look like this and I think it's super cute how it just looks like a bunch of eggs inside of a nest. <laughs> These guys are pretty common if you have mulch in a garden bed because they are great composters and usually when you add organic material to your garden, these will show up and start to decompose that material. And despite there being eggs in this fungi, you can eat it. There's been no evidence of toxicity, but the fungi itself is super, super tiny, so it's not really worth it. And for our final mushroom of this video, we're doing a bit of a throwback. And when I say bit, I mean a lot because this photo is from 2010. I was going through a bunch of family vacation photos and my family went to England back in 2010. And I can't remember what park we were hiking in, but we found all of these funky mushrooms and I took pictures because I just thought they were so cool and so vibrant. And I think you'll recognize them when I show you the picture because it's kind of what most stereotypical drawings of mushrooms are based off of. And I'm talking about the Amanita muscaria. There are over 600 different species of Amanita mushrooms, and most of them are poisonous or will kill you. There are a select few species of Amanita mushrooms that are edible, but 99.9% .9 of the mushroom biology general science community will tell you to just avoid it completely unless you are like, a mushroom overlord and you really know your stuff. Because there are so many lookalikes in the Amanita family, it's very common for people to mistake them for something it's not. So all around, just a good idea to avoid Amanita mushrooms, even though they look pretty cool. Now, even though I just told you to not eat these mushrooms, what I'm about to say next might tempt some of you guys. So again, please do not eat this mushroom. This mushroom has hallucinogenic properties. However, like I just mentioned, the Amanita family is full of deadly species. And this one, the hallucinogenic properties are more as a result of being poisoned. So I highly doubt it's like the fun magic mushroom type of hallucinations. <laughs> so as tempting as it is, and as beautiful as this mushroom is, I do not recommend eating it. Just admire it from afar. Hi, Editing Jenny here. I feel like I need to kind of clarify everything I just said because as I'm watching back the footage, I kind of feel like my comments are slightly ignorant when talking about this mushroom. And to be fair, the Amanita muscaria is a pretty controversial mushroom within the mushroom community because there are people who do use this mushroom to microdose. So you'll kind of get answers from all over the spectrum, but majority of people agree that it is a toxic mushroom and it should not be used for consumption. And this kind of comes as a surprise when I tell people that I'm into mushrooms, but I don't have any experience with psychedelics. So hence why I kind of feel like maybe my comments are a little ignorant. I don't really know if that cleared up anything, but I hope it makes more sense. Um, and like I said, I'm not well versed in the world of psychedelics, so I'm not really the person to be talking about that sort of stuff. But I do believe that if you are gonna do psychedelic mushrooms, maybe just go with your traditional magic mushrooms instead of trying to find something like the Amanita Muscaria. Okay, that's all, bye. 
And that concludes my ramblings about mushrooms. <laughs> I'm still learning so much about this hobby and it's been such a fun experience and journey being able to go out in nature. And you know, like I said earlier, it's almost like a scavenger hunt for me. I just think it's so fascinating learning about how fungi interacts with nature and how they can have these symbiotic relationships with trees and plants around them. It's also been super fascinating and educational learning about how indigenous peoples have used these plants and fungi for generations for a myriad of things. It's just such a great experience getting in touch with the land and learning about how nature works and just really going back to the basics of things. I don't, I don't even know what to say. I'm just like, <laughs> I feel so weird geeking out about mushrooms. Like my younger self would have never pictured me being like this. I just really love nature and plants and there's just something about learning about this sort of stuff and being out there that just makes me feel so connected to something. I don't know, it, it sounds weird, but like, I don't know, it just, it just makes me really happy. <laughs> I might make another video in the future showing you guys more mushrooms that I have found because there's just so much out there to be discovered. If that's something you think you guys would like, please feel free to let me know down in the comments. And also if there's anything that I said in this video that you feel needs correction or I got something wrong, please also let me know because I am still learning. And of course I don't want to give false information to people. Thank you guys so much for letting me ramble on about mushrooms. Don't forget to check out Conservancy Collective if you want to get a cool little mushroom shirt like this or other cool nature themed apparel. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Like and subscribe. I'll see you later. Bye.